Hello there, welcome to Fundamentals of Biology, where in this session we're going to be looking at gas exchange. So gas exchange is the, the process by which animals get oxygen into their bodies and then get rid of waste carbon dioxide. And hopefully you realise why we need oxygen in our bodies. Um, in previous session we, we've looked at cellular respiration, so we, uh, you know that we need oxygen for ATP production so we can power cellular work. Um, and then during the process of cellular respiration, we generate waste carbon dioxide. So the process of gas exchange is bringing in oxygen and then getting rid of that waste carbon dioxide. So during this session, we're going to have a look at the, the main principles of gas exchange. So we'll talk about what it is and how it happens. And then we'll focus on different groups of animals because different animals will carry out gas exchange in different ways. And a lot of that will be determined by where they live, um, but also their size and activity levels. And that will also incorporate ventilation. So for us, that would be breathing, the, the process of bringing in oxygen-rich air and then getting rid of carbon dioxide-rich air. So we've got this process of ventilation, bringing the air in, and then gas exchange will occur. So we're going to have a look at those processes as we go through this session. Just like all of the other topics we've covered in biology so far, when we're talking about gas exchange, there are certain rules and key terms and key principles that we need to be aware of that will help us to understand the topic. So as we go through, we'll have a look at some of these. But let, first, let's get the basics done. So when we're talking about gas exchange, the first thing we need to be aware of is the respiratory medium. And the respiratory medium is the, the medium with which we are exchanging those gases. So as terrestrial animals, we are exchanging our gases with the air around us. So we're getting oxygen from the air we breathe in, and then we are getting rid of carbon dioxide in the air that we breathe out. So our respiratory medium is air. However, if you were a fish um, or you were a squid or something like that, you were an aquatic animal, well, then your respiratory medium is water. So you're just getting your oxygen and getting rid of your CO2 in the water around you. Okay, so that's the respiratory medium. You also need to have a respiratory surface. And the respiratory surface is where you're actually exchanging those gases. That's where you're extracting oxygen and you're getting rid of your carbon dioxide. And respiratory surfaces come in a really wide range of types. Um, depending on what type of animal you've got and depending on what the respiratory medium is. So we're going to have a look at some of those as we go through. But there are three key principles that all respiratory surfaces share. So the first thing to know about respiratory surfaces is that gas exchange is proportional to surface area. What that means is that the larger the surface area you have, the more gas you can exchange across it. So it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? The, if you've just got a very, very small area that is optimized for carrying out gas exchange, well, that's not going to be as efficient as if you have a really, really large surface area. So the first thing that we find with all successful respiratory surfaces is they have a large surface area. The next thing to, to know is that Gas exchange is inversely proportional to membrane thickness. And that's just a fancy way of saying the thinner the surface is, the quicker some uh, gases will be exchanged across it. What you want from a successful gas um, respiratory surface is for it to be very, very thin. So the thinner the, the surface, the quicker oxygen and carbon dioxide can diffuse across them. And the thicker your respiratory surface, the slower those gases will diffuse across them, which is obviously a bad thing. You want to be getting oxygen in and carbon dioxide out as quickly as possible. We've done the session on tissue types, so hopefully you can start to picture in your mind the type of tissue type that would be optimal for a respiratory surface. So hopefully you're thinking about the simple squamous epithelial tissue and that is exactly what we tend to find within our respiratory surfaces. It's very, very thin, um, which would be optimal for gas exchange. We need a large surface area and we need it to be thin. And the third thing to know about gas exchange is that gases can only diffuse across a membrane when they are dissolved in an aqueous solution. 
So if you want to dissolve carbon dioxide from your blood into the um, air in your lungs or oxygen from the air in your lungs to your blood, those gases first have to be dissolved. Your respiratory surface needs to have a certain level of moisture to enable those gases to dissolve so then they can diffuse across the membrane. If they're not dissolved, they won't diffuse through successfully. The three principles that all respiratory surfaces share is that they are thin, they are moist, and they have a large surface area. Okay, so we're going to look at quite a few different types of respiratory surfaces we go through. Uh, but just keep in mind that all of them will share those three principles. So as we go through, what we'll see is that the size of the animal that we're talking about and its location, so where it lives and how it lives, will determine the type of respiratory system that it has. So let's go through and talk about some different types of animals and how they carry out gas exchange. Let's start by looking at animals that have water as their respiratory medium. And when we look at those animals, what we find is that they will typically use gills for carrying out gas exchange. So Gills are the adaptation for obtaining oxygen from water. So where uh, water is your respiratory medium, gills will typically be your respiratory surface. But there are some serious problems with having water as, a, as your respiratory medium. And one of the first things is that water carries a lot less oxygen than air. So it's actually harder to, to get as much, enough oxygen from the water around you um, than if you were using air as your respiratory medium. The other thing to be aware of with water is that it has a um, inverse relationship between temperature and salinity and oxygen concentration or dissolved oxygen concentration. So as temperature increases, the dissolved oxygen concentration decreases. And as salinity increases, the dissolved oxygen concentration decreases. If you were a animal living an aquatic animal living in a cool freshwater stream for instance you would have access to a lot more dissolved oxygen than if you were an animal living on a tropical coral reef where your the water temperature may be 25 26 degrees celsius um, and you're looking at 35 parts per thousand salinity compared to in this cool freshwater stream where you might have a temperature of five six degrees celsius um, and 0% salinity or 0 parts per thousand salinity. You've, it, it's something important to, to realise and remember about um, aquatic organisms that are using gills to actually carry out gas exchange is this relationship between dissolved oxygen concentrations and temperature and salinity. Gills, they do meet the requirements that we talked about on the previous slide though. They provide a very large surface area, they are very thin and Obviously, as the animal is living in water, they are also moist. So they, they meet the three requirements of a successful respiratory surface. Um, and what we can see on the, the, the diagrams here are four different examples of gills in aquatic animals. Now, clearly, there are, there are a lot of aquatic animals that still use air as their respiratory medium. So marine mammals, for instance, and a lot of the um, aquatic reptiles, so turtles, for instance, they're still using air as their main source of respiratory medium or their main source of oxygen. But what we can see here are four examples of aquatic animals that have evolved to use gills. So top left hand side here we can see a sea star from the phylum Echinodomata. And when you look at a cross section through one of the arms of the sea star, you can see the gills here in pink and they are actually interspersed within the actual tissue of the animal. Okay, so you can see those there, you can see the tubular feet of the sea star underneath. When we move across here, we can see the, uh, a marine worm, a polychaete worm uh, from the phylum Annelida. And these actually have external gills that you can see within the, the diagram here. And these, um, these gills are actually at, at risk if you like, because they're external um, and they, they're sort of nice and plump and, and pink because they're full of blood, they can be attacked. Other animals might want to eat them. So what we tend to find with a lot of these, and you, you might just be able to make this out on the, on the picture here, 
um, or if you've ever kept a, a marine aquarium, you'll probably be familiar with these. A lot of these marine worms um, come under the, the groupings of bristle worms. They'll actually have bristles, these little spines that, that stick out between the, the gills to actually protect the gills. Um, and that's one of the problems with having external gills is that they can be an attractive meal for other animals. So you tend to have to have some way of protecting them. So down here we've got a, a scallop from the phylum mollusca and you can see that these have evolved to actually have their gills inside so they're actually protected by the shell but that does come with certain issues that we'll talk about on the on the next slide um, which is ventilation so if you've got gills that are actually inside the animal yeah they're protected which is great but then you've got the problem of reduced water flow over the gills. The gills need to have a constant flow of water over them to carry out gas exchange, to keep delivering oxygen and getting rid of carbon dioxide. So if you have gills inside the body, we can see the same thing here with this crayfish from the phylum Arthropoda. Well, they've got the same problem. You've got gills inside that are protected, which is great but then you need to have some way of ventilating those gills. You need to be able to bring water into them and get rid of the, the wastewater that's full of carbon dioxide. But here we can see four different types of animals that use gills for gas exchange. Now clearly I've missed probably the, the most famous group of animals that use gills and those are the fish. So we can see here that, that fish have gills and as we know, the gills are internal they're not external to the animal um so like, like we saw with the polychaete worm uh, so they need to be ventilated so to increase efficiency of gas exchange most organisms will have to ventilate their gills and ventilation is is what we would consider breathing really where we're forcing or bringing fre um, fresh oxygenated air into our lungs and then getting rid of waste carbon dioxide laden air well, it's the same for aquatic organisms. They need to bring water that is full of oxygen over their gills and also to get rid of water that is full of carbon dioxide. So that process is what we refer to as ventilation. The, one of the, the big issues with living in water, though, is that it's much more dense than the air that we live in. So if you want to ventilate your gills within water, you need to invest a lot more energy into it because water is more dense. It's just harder to shift through your body or across your body. What we tend to find with fish is they have lots of different ways to maximize or to, to increase the efficiency of their gas exchange. So one of the key ways in which they do this is to use a counter current system. So the way this works is that the, the blood that is flowing through the gills will actually flow in the opposite direction to the water flowing over the gills. So what this does is it creates a consistent concentration gradient of oxygen rich water and carbon dioxide rich blood cr constantly meeting each other. So you maintain a concentration gradient and that will then enable the um, you to maintain a or the fish to maintain a, a concentration gradient to maintain gas exchange and what we see with this system is that it's very very efficient so it can mean that fish are able to extract up to 80 percent of oxygen from the water that passes over their gills so it's a very efficient process what we also see with fish is that we get slightly different ways in which they ventilate their gills so we can see here two different types of fish. So we have two main groups of fish, which are the cartilaginous fish. So the shark, skates, rays, and chimeras. They belong to a group called the chondrichthys. And then at the bottom here, we have an example of a bony fish. So bony fish belong to the group osteichthys. And this, when we think of fish, it's typically what we think of. And if you look at this part of the head here, you can see that they have this plate that covers their gills. This is called an operculum. But when we look at one of the chondrichthys, so we look at this shark diagram here, you can see that they don't have the operculum. They just have these visible gill slits. So this does have a big impact on how these different fish ventilate their gills. The operculum that we find in bony fish has muscles attached to them. So they can contract those muscles, which moves the operculum, and then they, that will help them to draw water in through their mouths and pass it 
over their gills. So that classic gulping motion that you see with goldfish, um, for instance, is them ventilating their gills. They're bringing water into the mouth and then passing it over the gills. Because a lot of the chondrichthys, that the cartilaginous fish, don't have that, they don't have the operculum, to ventilate their gills, they use something called ramjet ventilation or ram ventilation. And that is where they swim forward. And they, as they swim forward, they leave their mouths open slightly. And then that will force water in through the mouth and then over the gills. So you'll often hear that, that sharks have to keep swimming forward or else they'll drown. Well, it's not strictly true. They, it's not that they'll drown. They, they, they will slowly asphyxiate. So there are... There are um, cartilaginous fish that have evolved more muscular um, gill slits and they can actually do some ventilation they can do some pumping of water over their gills but most sharks do actually need to keep swimming forward or position themselves in a current some way in which water is constantly flowing into their mouths and over their gills or else they will start to asphyxiate where they're not getting enough oxygen from the water around them to meet their metabolic demands okay so those are gills they meet the three requirements of a, of a successful gas exchange surface or respiratory surface. They have a large surface area, they're thin and they're moist. But living in water, having water as your respiratory medium, comes with its challenges. Next, we can move out of the water and we can move on to land. So we're moving from water as being our respiratory medium to air being that medium. So for terrestrial insects where air is the respiratory medium, we have something called the tracheal system. If you've not looked at insects before, this might come as a bit of a surprise to you. It's quite an interesting um, system. So we can look at the diagrams below and we'll, we'll talk about what it does. So essentially, the way that the tracheal system works is the along the side of the animal, you will have these little openings called spiracles. So if you ever get the chance to examine a... Um, a larger insect, so a, a large locust or um, a giant Madagascan hissing cockroach, for instance, and you have a look at them down the sides, what you'll notice is that they'll have these small openings called spiracles. And those spiracles will move into these reinforced tubes called trachea. And then these trachea will start to branch off and get smaller and smaller into what we call tracheoles, and those tracheoles, again, keep branching and branching. And then ultimately, they will terminate on the plasma membranes of individual body cells. What the, the tracheal system does is it actually carries out a direct exchange of gases between the external environment, so the air around the insect, and each individual body cell, which is obviously quite impressive, but it does force some limitations on those animals. So it's one of the reasons why insects, for instance, are limited in the size that they can grow to. And one of the reasons for that is that this tracheal system, although very efficient, is only efficient when you have a small body size. Because you're relying on the movement of gases and the exchange of gases between individual body cells and the air around the animal. So it has its limitations. But it's quite an interesting little system. What we do find is that the, the direct flow of air from the spiracles into the trachea and the tracheoles can be supplemented with air that is stored within these air sacs. So if you look at the left diagram here, you can see these purple air sacs here, and they act as little reservoirs of air. So if the animal needs to suddenly exert a lot of energy quite quickly, well, as we know, energy is ATP and ATP production requires oxygen so you might need a lot of oxygen quite quickly so for instance you've got a, a, a grasshopper that suddenly needs to avoid a predator so a bird swooping for it some, or something so it needs to move quite quickly well you have this little backup this little reservoir of air that you can use to generate ATP quite quickly okay so air sacs can be found near more oxygen demanding tissues providing a reservoir of gas so that could be quite handy and what we also find is that muscle contractions so although the um, insects don't ventilate their system in the same way that we saw with the um, with fish on the previous slide where you're actively pumping 
um, water in and over the gills, so in this case it would be air. Instead, what they rely on are muscle contractions to turn their respiratory system, their tracheal system, into a bellows. So by contracting their muscles, they're forcing air out of the system and then clean air into the system. It works really, really well because if you think about it, the more exercise that you're doing, the more oxygen you require. But the more exercise you're doing, the more you're ventilating your tracheal system. So the more muscles you're contracting and more, more vigorously. So that means that you're forcing carbon dioxide rich air out of the body and more oxygen rich air into the body. And the, the, the best example of this is in flying insects. So flying is probably the most energetically expensive activity that an animal does. And not just insects, but we'll talk about birds in a bit. Uh, but flying does require an awful lot of ATP energy. So it requires a lot of oxygen. And what we see with insects that fly, their, their flight muscles are tied into the tracheal system quite nicely in the sense that the contracting flight muscles really do turn the tracheal system into a bellow. So it forces carbon dioxide out and brings in oxygen fresh air or oxygen rich fresh air into the system to, to keep the production of ATP going, which is required to power those flight muscles. And you'll quite often see insects sort of doing a, um, a sort of like a contracting twitching motion. And a lot of the time that is their way of ventilating their system. So that's the tracheal system then that we find in our terrestrial um, insects. So next we can look at lungs. And lungs are quite an interesting form of respiratory system. Uh, because they have a lot of pluses, uh, but they do come with a few drawbacks that, that, that need to be considered. The key thing to know about lungs is that they are restricted to one location in the body. So unlike the, the tracheal system that we saw in insects, which spreads through or covers the whole of the body, lungs are just in one place. So for us, that's obviously in our chest, in our thoracic cavity. And that raises one of the first issues that you have with lungs. If your lungs are in one part of the body, so for instance, us in our chest, well, you still need to get the oxygen that you're extracting from the air in your lungs to every part of your body. So it's all well and good getting oxygen into your lungs, but you need to get that oxygen to your brain, to the tips of your toes, to your arms. So that oxygen needs to get delivered and you need to be able to deliver CO2 to those lungs so you can get rid of it. So what we tend to find is animals that have lungs will typically have something that we call a closed system of circulation. And we're going to look at this in the next se in the next session. But a closed system of circulation is a more complex cir circulatory system that we find in animals. So we're talking about the heart and the blood vessels. Um, and it means that you can you can grow larger. So having lungs is great. You can grow larger, but you need to be able to deliver oxygen and CO2 to and from those lungs. So you have to have a more complex sort of high pressure closed system of circulation to deliver the oxygen and CO2. So this is the, the sort of pros and cons of lungs, if you like. And what we see is that lungs have evolved a lot of different times in different groups of animals. So when we look at some of our, um, our arthropods, so the arachnids, for instance, so spiders and scorpions, what we see is a lot of them will have quite basic lungs, though we call them book lungs, but they are lungs by all definition. So they are in one location within the body. They provide a high surface area. They are moist. They are thin. Um, and we'll look at, I'll show you a diagram of these in a sec. And then we also find that lungs have evolved in terrestrial mollusks. Uh, so when we look at slugs and snails, and, um, for instance, we see them that, see that they have simple lung spaces. So they are lungs, but not in the same way that our lungs um, are. So they're, they're, they're a bit more basic than that. But they still save, serve the same purpose. The most complex lungs, as you'd imagine, we find in vertebrates, such as ourselves. And it's believed that the the, the complex lungs that we have evolved from the swim bladders of lungfish. When we look at amphibians, and we'll, we'll look at a diagram of this as well, we see that the lungs are 
they're not great. They're, they're, they're not as complex as ours. They work in a different way and in, in the way that they're ventilated that we'll, we'll look at in a bit. Um, but they're, they're not very efficient. So with us, our lungs are very, very efficient. So we can carry out all of our gas exchange requirements using our lungs. But in amphibians, the, the lungs aren't sufficient enough to carry out all of their gas exchange. So they actually rely mostly on gas exchange across their skin. So they, they will breathe through both their skin and then also through their lungs. So it's one of the reasons why amphibians tend to have to stay moist. So there are some that can that can dry out okay, but the vast majority of amphibians, they need to they need to maintain moist skin because of the requirements of gas exchange that we talked about earlier. So a, a respiratory surface needs to be moist. So amphibians, if they dry out, they will often asphyxiate. They're not able to get enough oxygen into their blood. So on this diagram, we can see the, the basic gastropod lung that I mentioned just now. So we've got our terrestrial mollusks. So although most gastropods, so snails, for instance, most of them are aquatic, um, some are terrestrial. Um, and then some will actually switch between the two. So they're amphibious. But as snails started to move on to land, they, they stopped using gills for their gas exchange. Gills do not work out of water. They do not work on land um, because for a couple of reasons, really. If they first thing is they will often dry out. So gills are often exposed directly to the air. And that means that they will dry out. And as we've already established, for gas exchange to occur, your respiratory surface needs to be moist. So if gills dry out, they won't work. The next thing is that the um, gills, when they're in water, well, obviously water is much more buoyant than air. So the gills tend to, to sort of be supported by the water. Once you move out of water, you've suddenly, you're, you're trying to overcome gravity. So the weight of the gills will actually cause them to clump together. So you're vastly reducing their surface area because they, they clump together, they dry out, so the gills are no longer successful at carrying out gas exchange. So as these gastropods, as our snails started to move onto land, they moved away from gills and evolved these primitive lungs in the pileal cavity, which we can see up here within this snail. Okay, so that, that's, uh, oh, and the, when, you, when you look at a slug or snail, if you look at the mantle, which is this part behind the, the head here, you will see the respiratory pore. It's called a pneumostome. Um, and you'll actually see the, um, the slug or the snail actually opening and closing this. Uh, you don't want to leave it opened all the time because when it's open, you can lose water through evaporation. So they'll close it when they don't need to. And they'll actually bring in air through the pneumostome and it can be delivered then to, the, um, to their primitive basic lung. Okay, so that's the gastropod. When we look at our spiders and scorpions, we find um, some of them are pretty interesting, actually. Um, so here we can see a, a, a diagram of a spider, and here we can see the book lungs. So you can hopefully you can see why they're called book lungs, because they, they're, they're arranged in these kind of pages. So all, all it is is just a, 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 a area of epithelial tissue that provides a large surface area for gas exchange and they're just arranged in this kind of that like that look like the pages of a book um, and what we tend to find is a lot of spiders so most spiders rely on both book lungs and the tracheal system so we we talked about the tracheal system with insects but most spiders will actually rely on both so we can see the book lung here but over here, you can actually see a tracheal system as well. So they're relying on, on both the um, basic lungs and also the tracheal system for their gas exchange. When it comes to lungs, this is we, we're typically most familiar with our own. And what you can see here are, are, is a highly developed gas exchange system. So we have um, a, a left and a right lobe to our lungs and then we have this reinforced tube called the trachea. So air will come in through our nose or through our mouth, down into our pharynx, down into our larynx. And then basically you will have this separation. So you've got the tube here, which is the esophagus, which will deliver food and water down into our stomach. Or you can go here into the trachea, which will deliver air into our lungs. So air will move down 
into the, um, the trachea. So you can see here, it's got these ribbed areas here. So this is ribbed with cartilage to actually provide support so that the trachea doesn't close um, close over, which is obviously not great. If, you're, if your head slumped forward, you don't want your, your trachea closing because you wouldn't be able to breathe. So you have this reinforced cartilage to, to keep it open. So air will come down in the tr to the trachea and then it separates into a right and left bronchus. So the bronchus are, the, are these thick tubes here. And then a bit like we saw with the tracheal system in the insects, these bronchi, bronchi will start to then branch off and get smaller and smaller into what we call bronchioles. So the bronchioles are these smaller and smaller tubes. And then those bronchioles will keep branching off and getting smaller and smaller until we come up here and then what you'll see is that each of these bronchioles will terminate in these areas that look a bit like cauliflower here. And these are the alveoli. And the alveoli are incredibly thin. They provide an incredibly large surface area and they are surrounded by blood vessels that in themselves. So these are capillaries and that are also very, very thin. So you can imagine you've got the, the alveoli here that are uh, made up of our simple squamous epithelial tissue. We've got the capillary delivering blood to the lungs here, also made of simple squamous epithelial. So you've got two very thin layers. So then oxygen can diffuse from the alveoli into the blood and CO2 will diffuse from the blood into the alveoli and then we can breathe it out. Okay, so that is the, the basics of our, um, of our respiratory system, of our gas exchange system. And for ventilation, I'll talk more about this in a bit, but an important component of our ventilation, you can see down here, you can see this strip of muscle that sits beneath our lungs called the diaphragm. And that will be really important in creating something called negative pressure. And we'll go on to talk about that in a sec. So I just mentioned ventilation um, of our lungs and something called negative pressure. So let's have a look at what I mean by that in a bit more detail. So on this diagram here, we can see an amphibian. So we can see a, a basic frog diagram. Amphibians will actually ventilate their lungs in a completely different way to what we do it. Uh, so frogs use something called positive pressure ventilation. So we can see that on this diagram. So we know that lungs need to be ventilated. So we need to get rid of old air that contains carbon dioxide and we need to bring in fresh oxygen rich air. So that needs to be done. Different animals will do that in different ways though. So we can see with this frog, they use positive pressure breathing or positive pressure ventilation. So the way that works, we can see the, the, the frog here, we can see its lungs in pink. And remember what I said earlier that um, amphibians, so um, such as frogs will have quite primitive lungs. So they're not relying on lungs for all of their gas exchange. They're actually relying an awful lot on their skin for carrying out gas exchange, but they do use their lungs. So the way they do it, they will bring in a mouthful of air and through their mouth and through their nostrils. And then, so you see here, the frog gulps in air and then it will close its mouth and close its nostrils or nares. And then what it will do is raise its jaw and tongue. So it's physically forcing air from the mouth into the lungs. So it's much like us taking a balloon and blowing air into the balloon. So you're using positive pressure. You are physically clamping down the mouth and forcing air into the lungs, making it expand like a balloon. So that's why it's called positive pressure. We actually do, some, do it in a completely the opposite way. So we use something called negative pressure ventilation. Instead of taking in a mouthful of air, closing our nostrils and our mouth, and then using muscle contractions in the mouth to force air down into our lungs, what we actually do is increase the volume of our lungs rapidly to create a reduction in pressure. So to create negative pressure inside the lungs, which then causes air to rush in to balance out that negative pressure. So the way we do that, and you can practice taking a deep breath and you'll actually see this happening. So our lungs, 
you can see here in the diagram, um, are attached to our ribs. But, um, so you can see our rib cage here. So the lungs are attached to the, um, the inside of the ribs by, by connective tissue. And then the, the ribs have muscles attached to them. So when we inhale, and remember I mentioned the, the, diagra uh, the diaphragm, which is just down here. So when we inhale, what happens is our muscles contract. So the diaphragm will move down. So it contracts to move down. Our rib cage moves out and up. And then that, that, that basically is carried out by contractions of our chest muscles, but also our neck and back muscles as well will contract. That causes our rib cage to move outwards. And what this does in combination with the diaphragm is it causes the rapid increase in volume of the lungs. And that means that they, are, that they now have a reduced pressure because you're just rapidly increasing their, their volume and creates negative pressure so air will rush in through the mouth and through the nose will rush into the lungs to balance out the pressure inside the lungs and outside the body so when we actually inhale although it feels like we're sucking air in so if you take a deep breath it feels like we're actually sucking air in we're not. What we're actually doing is we're rapidly increasing the volume of our lungs and then the air will rush in to balance out that pressure. So we're not physically sucking in, if you like. We're just creating a negative pressure inside of our lungs. And then when we exhale, well, we just relax those muscles. So our rib cage will then move back into its original position. Our diaphragm will move up. And what that does is it squeezes the lungs, it reduces their volume, and then that pushes air out. So it pushes air out of the mouth. So that is basically how we ventilate our lungs. We're using the creation of negative pressure through muscle contraction. So we're con particularly the, the, um, our rib cage, we're moving our ribs out and up. Our diaphragm moves down. That creates negative pressure. Air rushes in. Um, and then gas exchange is carried out across the alveoli and then we relax those muscles and then that's, that re um, reduces the, the volume of our lungs so it constricts them, forcing air out. And birds are really, really interesting when it comes to respiratory systems. And that comes back to something that I mentioned earlier on and it's flying. So as I mentioned earlier, flying is probably the most energetically expensive activity that an animal can do because you're basically having to overcome gravity. You're having to overcome frictional forces in the air. Um, it requires an awful lot of energy. And as we know, when I'm talking about energy, we're talking about ATP. And to generate ATP, we need food and we need oxygen. And we're also generating carbon dioxide as a waste product. So if you're a bird and you need to fly, every time you flap those wings, you're relying on muscle contractions, which relies on ATP production, which requires oxygen and generates CO2 as a waste product that needs to be dealt with. So birds have had to evolve a very, very efficient gas exchange system. So as we see here, the avian respiratory system is structurally complex and functionally efficient. So it's a, it's a much more complex system to what we have, but it's also way more efficient than what we have as mammals. And the, 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 there are a number of reasons for its increased efficiency. So it comprises lungs that serve as gas exchangers, so they still use lungs, same as we do, but their lungs are very different to ours, and they also have air sacs. So typically seven to nine air sacs um, in, a, in typical birds, and they make up what we call the posterior and anterior air sacs. And what we can see here also is the lungs. And I said that the lungs are different to ours, and that is because the lungs of birds are unidirectional. What I mean by that is that air will only pass through them in one direction. So if you think about our lungs, we breathe air in and air goes into the lungs. We carry out gas exchange and then air will leave the lungs in the same way which it came in. So when we are exhaling, it's basically a waste of effort. All we're doing is we're getting rid of carbon dioxide rich air. 
we're not actually getting any oxygen in during our exhalation. So it's not very efficient. But the way that birds do it is they have these single tubes or these, sorry, these unidirectional tubes called parabronchi and they will enable air to flow posterior to anterior. So air will move in through the mouth, the nostrils, it will come down the trachea, it will move into the posterior air sacs, then it moves from the posterior air sacs into the lungs, and then it moves from the lungs into the anterior air sacs, and then it will move from the anterior air sacs back out into the trachea and then out the mouth. So you can see that bit here. So what this does, this, this, this grouping of air sacs means that the, the birds are never wasting an exhalation. They are able to keep freshly oxygenated air passing through their lungs during both inhalation and during exhalation. So they have a type of circular breathing, if you like, um, where they're always having oxygen passing through their lungs or oxygen rich air passing through their lungs so they're able to maximize the efficiency of gas exchange which is obviously necessary for carrying out flight birds are, are very very interesting when it comes to gas exchange on that the last thing to mention um, on this is the control of breathing and i'm going to focus on mammals breathing like Everything else that's carried out in the body is controlled by the brain, but it's controlled by the central nervous system. And within parts of the brain, we have specialized breathing control centers, and they are called the pons and the medulla oblongata. So good names, uh, but you can see on the diagram over here, this is the, the brain stem. So this is where the spinal cord comes up into the brain. And so, so this is the, the oldest part of the brain in terms of evolution. So this is where you'll find most of the, the, the more primitive functions of the brain, such as breathing. And we see that we've, we have these two different components here, or two different parts. So we've got a close up here um, and we can see the pons, which is located in this part of the brainstem. And then we have the medulla or the medulla oblongata located here. And the medulla is responsible for setting the basic breathing rhythm. So it is the medulla that is controlling your inhalation and your exhalation. So the amount that you're breathing in and breathing out. And it does this by measuring the pH of the blood and cerebrospinal fluid. So this is the, the fluid that sort of encases the brain, surrounds the brain in the spinal cord and also passes up through the ventricles of the brain. Um, and what we find, this goes back to something that we've mentioned um, in an earlier lesson, and that is that as carbon dioxide dissolves in water, or as carbon dioxide dissolves in an aqueous solution, that uh, some of that carbon dioxide will be converted into carbonic acid. So carbon dioxide, as it dissolves in water, will lead to a drop in pH. And the medulla is able to, to determine that. It's, it's measuring that. So as we're, breathe, as we're carrying out more exercise, we know that we are generating more carbon dioxide as a waste product of respiration. That carbon dioxide will dissolve in our blood and that will cause the pH to drop. The medulla is able to recognize that and it will respond by increasing our breathing rate. So it will increase the amount of carbon dioxide that we exhale, that we get rid of from our body and the amount of oxygen that we breathe in. So that is essentially how it does it. There's no magic involved in this. It's just your brain monitoring and measuring the pH of your blood. As the pH drops as a result of increased carbon dioxide, it will increase your breathing rate. As your exercise levels drop, and carbon dioxide levels fall, well, your pH will start to rise again and your breathing rate will slow. So that's what you see there. The medulla detects a drop in pH and initiates inhalation to increase oxygen supply, but also to get rid of carbon dioxide. What we see with the pons is that will have a play an important role in smoothing the transition between inhalation and exhalation. As mentioned previously, the inhalation process, the, the ventilation of our lungs, involves an awful lot of muscle contractions. 
So we have the muscle contractions of the diaphragm um, and the raising of the rib cage, which incorporates our pectoral muscles and our neck and back muscles. So that all has to be sort of regulated and um, synchronized to, to smooth these transitions between inhalation and exhalation. Um, and that's one of the things that is controlled by the POMs. So these are the, the, the basic breathing centers of the brain. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about brain structures in a later lesson. Okay, so that brings us to the end of this, this gentle introduction to um, gas exchange in different animals. So as always, I'll finish with some questions for you. So I'll read through them, give you a few minutes to answer them, and then we'll go through the answers together. So question number one. What are the three requirements of a gas exchange surface? Number two, why can it be harder to breathe in water? Number three, in what group of animals will you find book lungs? Number four, what activity can ventilate an insect's tracheal system? And then number five, why is the avian respiratory system so efficient? Okay, so five questions. I'll give you five minutes to answer them and then we'll go through the answers together. Okay, welcome back. Hopefully you had a chance to answer all of those. So let's go through the answers. So question number one, what are the three requirements of a gas exchange surface? Well, they need to be thin, moist and have a large surface area. Number two, why can it be harder to breathe in water? Well, there's a few things you could have mentioned there. Water holds less oxygen than air. It is more dense and viscous than air, so it requires more energy to ventilate. Um, and dissolved oxygen levels will be reduced as temperature and salinity increase. Okay, number three, in what group of animals will you find book lungs? Well, that's in our arachnids, so scorpions and spiders. Number four, what activity can ventilate an insect's tracheal system? Well, it's muscle contractions um, and muscle contractions through flying. So number five, why is the avian respiratory system so efficient? Well, if you have these posterior and anterior air sacs, along with unidirectional airflow through the parabronchi of the lungs, which ensures consistent gas exchange even during exhalation. Now, obviously, there could have been a number of ways that you could have written that. Key things that I was looking for were the, the fact that they aren't wasting exhalation, so they're carrying out gas exchange even during exhalation, and that's because they, they have the air sacs, posterior and anterior air sacs, and unidirectional flow through the lungs. Okay, so don't worry too much if you didn't do too well on those questions. You can go back over this, uh, do some additional reading, um, and you will pick it up. So hopefully now you should be familiar with the principles of gas exchange. Um, and then we've also talked about how different animals will actually carry out gas exchange, including ventilation. So that's a, a, an introduction to gas exchange in animals. Hopefully that was interesting. And I'll see you in the next session. Thanks very much.